Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at virginiafarmbureau.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all the wonderful products we enjoy, brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Farms, vineyards, and historic sites are trendy new destinations for lovebirds. Chef John Maxwell makes us a recipe featuring peak of summer garden vegetables, and breakfast on the farm is about a lot more than homemade pancakes. Welcome back everyone. We're coming to you from the King Family Vineyards in Crozet and more couples are choosing locations just like this one and other historic farms as a backdrop for their wedding celebrations. What is drawing these couples to these wide open spaces for their big day? Since Carrie Buster started her company, Blush Events, nearly a decade ago, more couples have tied the knot in historic Virginia locations, specifically farms and vineyards. A lot of them want something historic. They want something outdoors with a view. They don't want that stuffy ballroom. Um, and then if you pick a ballroom, you might have that one type of just elegant vibe, but they might want a different theme wedding. So you can kind of change things up with an outdoor venue. Country chic and rustic is like the most popular theme I'm seeing with my brides. So that's the easiest way to incorporate it without having to bring in a lot of decor is using the venue for a big backdrop. This trend is catching on as fast as Virginia's wine industry can grow. According to Buster, her business has seen a 70% increase in planning and booking weddings for couples at wineries and farms over the past eight years. So it's roughly about, I'm seeing an average of $40,000 there for the venue fee and then for catering. Delicious wine, bucolic mountain vistas, and rustic charm would help any couple fall in love. But beyond that, vineyard and farm weddings make an unforgettable event for guests too. Kelly Bauer with King Family Vineyards in Albemarle County near Crow Jose says that weddings are now so popular that some couples are already booking for 2019. We have over 100, over 100 this year. We joke that it's almost like she has to book the venue and then find somebody to, to, to meet at the end of the aisle. Um, I think the sooner after the engagement that you get on looking for the venue, especially it seems to me that most of the brides already have an idea of what they want. Like most agritourism businesses, King Family Vineyards started solely as a working farm. In their case, they raised alfalfa, but after a couple years of drought, the family turned to grapes to keep the farm in agriculture. Someone suggested growing grapes, that this was a, a produce growing area for over 100, maybe 150 years. I'm not sure of the exact dates on that, but uh, many, many years, and it would be a very good place to grow grapes. And so they explored that option and found out that that indeed was that was good advice. But it isn't just vineyards that have Virginia's most picky brides swooning over their nuptial day. Historic properties like Meadow Event Park, the birthplace of the famous racehorse secretariat and home to the State Fair of Virginia, has also seen a boom in weddings and private events. A lot of our brides come here because of the beautiful green grass, the beautiful trees, the historic nature of the property, um, it is the birthplace of Secretariat and it means something, so it's, it's unique. We've, we've tried to enter the market also and price ourselves to be affordable for folks so you can have a fabulous upscale wedding at a historic property and afford it. The property not only includes the historic barns where Secretariat was raised, but also Meadow Hall, a luxurious mansion with hand-carved wood accents throughout the dramatic halls. The venue also serves as a museum honoring Secretariat and the Virginia horse. When you walk this property, you realize you're not just at a facility, you're at, you're at a sacred place. And for the equine industry and for racing enthusiasts and for horse lovers in Virginia, 
Secretariat is Secretariat is it, and um, you know he was the king of the sport. Our goal when we meet with clients is to listen and find out what the bride and groom want, what's important to them. It's kind of a nice reception space. You you walk around this building in the mansion at Meadow Hall, and and your guests not only are at a, a great uh, event, but the facility itself is full of memorabilia. So it's it's a combination reception space, museum. Um, it just works really well. If you'd like to have a private event or a wedding at a rural venue, the key is to book early and be flexible on your dates. For more information on planning a perfect farm or vineyard wedding, go to wineryweddingguide.com and click on Virginia. After all, Virginia is for lovers. The agritourism industry is rapidly growing. A 2017 Virginia tax study found that a wide range of public activities on farms accounts for a total of $2.2 billion in economic activity. These operations range from pick your own berry farms to farm wineries and fall festival sites. Agritourism supports 22,000 jobs and generates $840 million a year for farmers. And these businesses pay $135 million in state and local taxes. The most popular agritourism destinations are Northern and Central Virginia, along with the Shenandoah Valley. But you can find a farm to visit almost anywhere in the Old Dominion. I'm Mark Viette. Coming up on In the Garden, I'm going to talk about easy potatoes. Stay with us. More than 90 years ago, the Virginia Farm Bureau made a promise to our local farmers to protect and preserve a way of life they'd worked so hard to establish. Today, our insurance agents work to protect all Virginians, not just farmers. Anyone can be a Farm Bureau member and enjoy the many benefits of membership. There's a local Farm Bureau in every county of the state. We think everyone should be a friend of the farm. Visit our website at virginiafarmbureau.com to learn more. You're going to need me. You're going to need us. All of us. You're going to need our help with your water your air, your food. You're going to need our determination, our compassion. You're going to need the next generation of leaders to face the challenges the future will bring. And we promise we'll be there when you need us. Potatoes are an easy and fun food to grow, and Mark Fiat tells us you can still plant them in midsummer and obtain a harvest this year in the garden. Potatoes are easy to grow. For some of us who have grown them out in the garden, that's a great way. You could take your vegetable garden and you could do the same thing I'm going to do here in your vegetable garden. But for those of us who live on a deck or a patio or don't have garden space, this is a fun little project. Even the whole family can do it, or you can do it yourself. But potatoes, keep in mind what you get in the store. You know, you might think it's a root. It's not a root. It's actually a stem. It's called a rhizome. And this is one of the fingerling potatoes. And if you look very close, you can see these little spots and these are really known as nodes. So if I were to turn this stem this way, if this was above the ground, these would produce leaves. Therefore, this is a stem and a rhizome. Now, I like fingerling potatoes. If you're gonna to go to the trouble to grow your own potatoes, I mean, you can grow the ones that you can get for 29 cents to 59 cents a pound, but when it comes to some of the fingerling potatoes, they can cost as much as $3.99 a pound. So you might want to grow some of the unusual ones. A lot of these potatoes have come from the areas uh, within the Andes, and a lot of hybridization's taken place in Sen. But a lot of these different fingerling potatoes are known to make the very best mashed potatoes, very best German mashed potatoes, um, or German uh, sliced potatoes, or boiled potatoes. So it is specifically known for different things. To give you an idea, of what this looks like. Here is potato with the nodes. Here's an older potato, and I'm sure many of us have left some of these potatoes in our cabinets, uh, and sometimes um, they don't look as good as this. And But if you look, you can see where out of each of those nodes, new potatoes and stems and roots are growing. 
you can actually see here little baby potatoes being produced. I usually recommend that you order disease-free potatoes online from companies that supply them. Uh, you can, or some people, keep their potatoes year after year and save a couple of them to cut up for their next planting. What you're going to want to do is cut them up like this, make sure each one has an eye, let them dry out for a day or two, and that's what we're going to use. I really like the purple potatoes, too. They're great. Some when you cook them, they turn yellow. Some when you cook them, they stay purple. There's even orange potatoes and pink potatoes. What I'm going to do is take this bushel basket, and I like to use organic soil. So the soil that I like to use is a Spoma All Organic Garden Soil. And I'm going to put about six inches in the bottom of this. So I've got red, white, blue, even pink. And I'm just going to take these potatoes, and they're sometimes called seed potatoes, because we're, what we're doing is seeding new potatoes. And sometimes if I have a bigger bushel basket, I'll use a few extra. Then I'm going to take more soil. I also, as fertilizer, might use Espoma bulb tone, or I might use biotone or bone meal. But I'm going to cover these potatoes with about three inches, and they're going to continue to grow right through the soil. So every week or so, as they grow, I'm going to add more soil so the soil comes right within the top of this container. By the time the potato has stopped growing and I'm filling in soil, the potatoes are probably going to get a foot to maybe 18 inches tall. Then the old foliage is going to die back and wither. And I'd say three months from now. And you can do this in uh, March. Maybe April would be better. May, June. I even do it in July. And once the foliage withers and dies back, I take my bushel basket step back and drop it on the ground. It splits open and the potatoes are all ready to be harvested and ready to be stored or your first meal with your own homegrown red, white, and blue potatoes. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Curious about how to use eggplant in your summer meals? Chef John Maxwell shows us how to make a homemade dish that's up next in Heart of the Home. The State Fair of Virginia is known for its family-friendly atmosphere, exciting attractions, and of course, fabulous fair food. The most important focus continues to be youth and adult livestock competitions and dozens of competitions where other Virginians can win a coveted State Fair Blue Ribbon. Everything from prize vegetables to baked goods to crafts and photography are featured each year as the best of the best. To learn more about this year's State Fair of Virginia, visit our website at statefairva.org. Fresh Virginia vegetables are in season right now, and that includes eggplant. Chef John Maxwell shares a unique recipe for your next picnic in the heart of the home. Hi, and welcome to the heart of the home. We're here at Meadow Hall at Meadow Event Park in Doswell, Virginia. And I'm Chef John Maxwell, and we're gonna be playing with some great Virginia food. Today, it's eggplant, one of my favorite. There's lots of different ways to fix it, and this is one from the Middle East. It's called Baba Ganoush. And I, I love that, that name, it is just perfect. Uh, reminds me of my Italian grandfather. All right, so I've got a, uh, a skewer here, a toothpick will work, and I'm gonna take this eggplant and just kinda jab it everywhere, popping holes in it, because as I bake this, I don't want it to blow up. And I, I, not literally blow up, but it'll, it'll expand because of the moisture in it, right, and pop the skin, and I don't want that to happen. And I want all the moisture to stay in and the steam to get out, all right? So this is gonna take about 30 minutes. I'm gonna move this into the oven, right? And then when it's done, I'll bring it out and we'll start making some baba ganoush. All right, here it is. It's uh, nice and warm. It just came out of the oven. 
right. and you can see how it's gotten all wrinkly um, from where the it's, it's collapsed in on itself and we're getting ready to now process this. All right. I'm going to cut the end off and cut it into wedges. Mm, mm, mm. Smells so good. I love eggplant. My Italian grandparents taught me to play with this and every time I smell an eggplant I think of them. All right. So I'm going to scrape the meat out with this spoon. I'm just going to take this and run it right straight through, try not to get any of the skin. All right. And I'm going to put this down into a bowl. And do it with each of these four sections. All right. Just about finished with this. Now, when, as usual, when we're doing the show, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to talk about the quantities of any of this. The website, uh, chefjohnmaxwell.com, has the recipes and all of the ingredients are listed up there, so you can get that information relatively easy. Now, I'm going to chop this up, and there's a couple of ways to do it. I've got this neat little knife, all right, and I can just chop it up in the bowl. But the sound guy is giving me an evil eye, so I'm going to go ahead and knock this out here all right. All right. and chop it up uh, the old-fashioned way. I'm going to put this in a bowl and begin to season it and mash it just a little bit more. Now this is, a, this is a relish, and it really doesn't matter how smooth you get it. You can get it as smooth as you want. If you want to put it in a processor and make it into a paste, you can do that. Uh, I like it nice and chunky. That's the way I remember it. And so I'm going to take some hummus, all right, or some tahini rather, which is a sesame paste, almost like peanut butter made with sesame seeds, and put that in. Right. And a little bit of cumin, about a quarter teaspoon, right. about a tablespoon of chopped garlic, right. and some parsley. And I'm just going to mash this around until it's pretty well smoothed out. Okay. I'm going to add about a quarter cup of lemon juice. A tablespoon of olive oil. Just mix it so all the ingredients are blended and the texture is where you want it. So that's basically it. I'm going to season it with a little bit of salt and pepper. Now I'm going to put it in a bowl and serve it to you. All right, and here's what it looks like finished. We've got the baba ganoush with vegetables and pita bread uh, triangles to dip with. Right? This is marvelous, pungent with garlic and sesame. Uh, the eggplant is rich. It's wonderful. Join us next week on Heart of the Home when we get to play with more great Virginia food. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at VAFB.com, as well as on Chef Maxwell's website at ChefJohnMaxwell.com. Eggplant is raised commercially on just 56 Virginia farms, but it's also available across the state every summer at farmers markets and farm stands. Each year, Virginia growers earn a combined $71 million from eggplants and other vegetable crops like peppers and potatoes. Eggplants require a good amount of fertilizer and generally thrive in hot weather. However, they must have well-drained soil and do not grow well in very humid conditions. 
Many home gardeners pickle or freeze their eggplant to enjoy later. Boating under the influence is illegal no matter where you boat. Law enforcement officers will be conducting heightened enforcement patrols during Operation Dry Water, looking for boaters who are boating under the influence. Alcohol is the leading contributing factor in recreational boating deaths. Stay safe, stay sober, never boat under the influence. Many Virginians have never visited a farm, but they're interested in how their food is raised. Jeff Ishy with WVPT TV in Harrisonburg takes us to visit a Shenandoah Valley farm family that invited folks over for a family meal and a trip around the farm. Breakfast on the farm. Hot pancakes on the griddle, sausage, and all the fixings. Virginia Cooperative Extension recently hosted a, a special event for the general public at the Arbogast family farm in Rockingham County. The goal was to invite people to a working farm for breakfast and to have an opportunity to talk with farmers about what they do. Lauren Arbogast of Lacey Spring, Virginia, was one of five farmers from around the nation chosen to represent U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance as one of the faces of agriculture. She says the idea for this special event in Virginia actually came from outside the state. So the inspiration was really Michigan. Um, Michigan Cooperative Extension does a breakfast on the farm event. They've run it for several years. They alternate to different locations or different farms around the state and they get some really great attendance. It's specifically a community outreach event around agriculture. Senator Mark Obenchain represents Virginia's 26th district and applauded the effort as a way to communicate the importance of agriculture to the general public. Uh, it's a lot of fun and a uh, great way to introduce folks to uh, what really goes on in uh, our agricultural uh, sector here in the, uh, in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, it's great to see a lot of folks uh, coming in and uh, learning a little bit and uh, being introduced to, to farming. There were a lot of opportunities for people to learn more about what farmers do and to ask a lot of questions. That's according to Virginia FFA State President Ashley Yanego from Strasburg. This event is a really good opportunity for the community to learn about agriculture. A lot of the people that are attending here at the Abergas Farm, they are learning about conservation practices, the poultry industry, they learn about Virginia agriculture in the classroom, a lot of different aspects of agriculture. They'll even have hands-on with a calf and some goats, so it's a little bit of everything. Arbogast says people were not hesitant to inquire about how the farm is operated. A lot of questions. So on the hayride, we just talked about what we do here on our farm specifically, what we grow and we raise, but also the fact, you know, that we are stewarding our resources, our land and our water, the things that we take care of here on the farm, and the fact that we are like the majority of farms across the U.S. We are family owned and run. Um, a lot of questions stemmed around our practices as far as resource practices with the land and the water. Also a lot around um, the beef and the chickens that we raise and the process of getting them from a farm like this to a consumer's plate. Numerous Virginia agricultural organizations participated in the event and say they, they hope there will be another similar occasion in the near future. That's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We are so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good week. Chesapeake Bay.